This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. How could I, or anyone else for that matter, tell you what the best camera buys are right now for you? What manner of intellectual hubris is that? And taken from the opposite end of that perspective, what kind of stunted emotional development is required to pee all over the work of teams of engineers, optical designers, product managers, strategists, manufacturing teams, logistics teams, financial analysts, salespeople, and more, with a simple, that camera or that lens blows. Just asking. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to share with you my take, right, it's just my take, on the best camera buys in the industry today, that is, for cameras introduced in 2020, along with a single lens recommendation for each to really capture the value of that purchase. My hope is that, at the very least, my reasoning will help you to refine your own and lead you to a great shooting experience. So, first, shouts out to B&H, Nikon, Sony, Panasonic, Leica, Fujifilm, and Sigma, for making the gear available to me, you wouldn't believe what's just outside of frame, although I think I'll get to show you much of it later. And no, I don't get to keep any of it. Let's begin with uh, Fujifilm's XS10, their APS-C sized Marvel for a thousand bucks. Now, why the XS10 and not the X-T4? Well, because the XS10 is a smaller, lighter X-T4, same sensor and processor with Call it nine-tenths of its functionality at not much more than half the price. Has a trick or two up its sleeve that the X-T4 does not, like no recording limit for 8-bit 420 UHD 4K 24P, yet still manages to handle brilliantly. Is built to feel special. It really does. And with the kind of mode dial with which most of us contemplating a switch into Fujifilm from another brand are more familiar and comfortable, rather than the more traditional analog dials for which Fujifilm is justifiably famous, is likely to be more appealing. On the other hand, hey, hardcore Fujifilm fans may prefer that more traditional manual of arms of the X-T4. Almost everyone would appreciate the X-T4's superior battery life, superior 3.7 million dot EVF, and side-mounted dual card slots. The autofocus in both Fujifilm cameras remains in third, maybe fourth place now, behind Sony, Canon, and Nikon. And while their red badge zooms are among the best out there for IQ, handling, build quality, and autofocus performance irrespective of sensor format, Fujifilm's Fast Primes, 16-24 and 35 1.4, 56 1.2, and 92.0 could all use updates for improved IQ, focus, and focus breathing for video. Quieter, smoother, faster. Alternatives? Well, only the X-T4 has IBIS, but the X-T3 has the dual card slots and higher resolution EVF that the X-S10 does not, though not the flippy screen. The X-T3 is currently selling for 50% more than the X-S10, however. The $200 less expensive than X-S10 X-T200 takes the same lenses, great, has the same flippy screen, great, and has the same manual of arms as the X-S10, but it also shares the X-S10's smaller, lower-resolution EVF, uses a more traditional, slightly lower-resolution sensor, and is much more constrained when it comes to video. Beyond Fujifilm itself, the Micro Four Thirds Panasonic G9 for $1,200 and $1,400 GH5 will be more compelling to some of us. Never mind their superior video chops, dual card slots, and far superior EVF, their lens ecosystem is dramatically larger with a number of truly phenomenal lenses, sometimes smaller and lighter, though not less expensive than their Fujifilm equivalents. 
The differences between Micro Four Thirds and APS-C systems are smaller than many people understand. And while the XS10 uses hybrid phase detect and the G9 and GH5 use contrast detect only autofocus, both systems are outstanding in good light for stills. And both are less performant than Sony, Canon, or Nikon for video AF, especially tracking. No matter. The XS10 is really so good that it should be compared even to Sony's full-frame, almost twice the price, A7 III and A7C, because heck, a photographer like Martin Munkashi, for example, could make images like these... Gordon Parks could make images like these. And cinematographer Arthur Edison could film a movie like this. Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. All without any autofocus, any burst rate, or any frame rate other than 24 frames per second in 1928, 1957, and 1942, respectively. The bottom line is that right now, to my utter astonishment, I will tell you that the X-S10 is the Fujifilm camera I'd get if I could only have one from them. It's that good. In fact, if I had to pick the single best camera value of 2020 across the board, the X-S10 would be it. What if you could only have one lens? What would I recommend? I'd pair the XS10 with this guy, the brilliant XF 16-55 2.8 red badge zoom. Funny, I own this lens. I don't own a body at the moment. You'd suddenly have one of the most compact, performant, easy-to-use, and cost-effective setups on the planet for unobtrusive run-and-gun filmmaking. Or, if you're willing to think outside of the box just a little bit, an excellent and very compact exceptionally versatile street photography kit. Image quality of the 16-55 to 2.8 is, as I said earlier, excellent. It's slower and more expensive than any one of Fujifilm's classic 1.4 primes, but because it's better corrected, has fast and silent autofocus that these primes do not, and is optimized for video, I think it's the way to go. It's the equivalent of a full-frame field of view and depth of field of 24 millimeter to 82.5 at f4, better at the long end than the traditional full frame Holy Trinity 24 to 70 for portraits, and the XF 16 to 55 2.8 is smaller and lighter to boot. No, the 16 to 55 is not image stabilized, but the XS10 is with in body image stabilization, and that makes a difference. And while it's true that the 2.8 maximum aperture is the equivalent of a full-frame f4 for depth of field, let's not get piggy. Set to 55 millimeters and focused to a minimum social distance of 6 feet, this still means a depth of field of just 4.4 inches. Perfect for portraiture where everything from the tip of your subject's nose to just ahead of the ears will be tack sharp with nice fall off from there. I think you can tell I really like this combination. Next, Nikon's Z6 II. Where are you? This guy. Though, before we go any further, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Skillshare, for making this episode possible. Skillshare is an online learning community with literally thousands of curated classes on everything from photography, film, video, and music, which happens to be my playpen, to web development, business analytics, entrepreneurship, and more. But the thing I really like about Skillshare is the breadth of the subjects it covers, allowing for the serendipity of classes outside of one's obvious focus to tie in beautifully with and expand upon what already excites us. I'm talking about honing, for example, one's artistic voice with Nathaniel Webster's Creativity Unleashed. I would imagine you have a desire to start creating, otherwise you wouldn't be watching this class right now. and Sometimes it can be very difficult to know where to start, right? That's a very common obstacle. Believe it or not, you already have most, if not all, of the answers that you're looking for. I'll tell you, from where I sit, this one course alone is worth the price of admission. Malcolm Gladwell fan? Check. Mining one's childhood to rediscover and hone one's inner self. The power of music. Journaling. Check, check, 
and check. So, newbie or wizened pro, dabbler or deep diver, membership access to Skillshare's catalog of constantly expanding classes and workshops opens up a world of learning and sharing with your instructors and fellow members ad-free on your schedule, usually in under an hour, for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. Check them out. The first thousand people to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity. And thanks, Skillshare, for sponsoring this video. Nikon's Z6 II. I think it fair to say, conventional wisdom notwithstanding, that the Z6 II is, on balance, the least compromised 24 megapixel full frame ILC mirrorless hybrid on the market which is especially great news for Nikon shooters. Yay! I am pleasantly surprised to tell you that it is one of only three cameras thus far to pass my utterly simple yet maddeningly difficult to complete properly autofocus tracking test. On top of that, it has excellent ergos and EVF, a relatively clean menu system, decent IBIS, dual card slots now, and most important of all to me personally, the newest, most complete, and most compelling lineup of high performance, accessibly priced 1.8 primes and Holy Trinity 2.8 zooms on the market. And with a second processor now on board, I think the Z6 II is the value mirrorless ILC Nikon body, best positioned for improvements in AF performance over time through firmware updates. With this said, some of us may worry about Nikon's long-term viability. I'm not. The Z6 II still has a 30-minute recording limit, that's annoying, and a mini rather than full-sized HDMI port, which drives me to distraction. Its autofocus performance when it comes to IAF, still isn't quite up to Sony and Canon standards across the board. Its auto white balance can get a little funky at very high ISOs. It doesn't have 4K60 yet, but Nikon has promised it will via a firmware update APS-C crop only. It only offers a tilty screen, no flippy. It has two different format card slots, SD and XQD. Its lens catalog isn't as complete as Sony's or Canon's, especially at the long end. And you can save money by buying a Z5 or leftover Z6 instead. But the Z6 II has a better sensor than the Z5. That second card slot that the Z6 and Z7 don't, which matters to me for filmmaking. And that second processor that only the Z7 II does, which again I think is interesting primarily for its potential for improved autofocus performance. But you will pay a 50% premium over the Z6 II for the Z7II's extra megapixels. As for other brands, well, the original Z6 was already far more enjoyable in hand than any Sony with better color and offered video specs superior to the a7 III and a7C. It was more complete and ergonomically superior to Canon's R and RP without the overheating worries of the subsequent EOS R6. With the Z6 II, I think it's fair to say Nikon offers a camera with autofocus that certainly bests Panasonic's otherwise superb S5, achieves card slot parity with the EOS R6, if not autofocus or video performance at the margin, though for most of us the differences are too small to matter, except perhaps for wildlife or sports. Fast sports lawn bowling doesn't count. But beats it on price by a not inconsequential 400 bucks and makes the Sony A7S III the camera within the Sony lineup to which it ought to be compared. Now, yes, at that point, the A7S III is an absolutely superior 4K video camera, but it's also an inferior stills camera and almost twice the price. In fact, the Nikon Z system 
is so much better than its first reviews. And the Z6 II is so close to faultless, with ISO 50,000 performance on par with the best out there, that if I had to pick the single best full frame value of 2020, this would be it. What if you could only have one lens for your Z6 II? If you're a photographer first, second, and third doing general photography, the Nikkor Z 50mm 1.8 is a brilliant lens in every way. I've already named it one of the last lenses you'd ever buy. Not as in you'd buy anything else before you buy this one, but because once you owned one, there'd simply be no reason to ever buy another 50. It's that good. If you are first and foremost about video, if you're about event shooting, the new Nikkor Z Holy Trinity zooms are arguably the best I've ever seen. So I'd start with the 24 to 70 2.8 and call it a day. 24 to 70 f4 in a clutch, but I don't like it as much. Next, uh, Panasonic's S5. The S5 is a smaller, lighter, less expensive S1 with only minor concessions, making it, in my book, the most performant, ergonomic, and complete video-centric 24-megapixel full-frame mirrorless ILC on the market at anywhere near the price. It has no overheating issues and no recording limit at UHD 24p 8-bit 420. As I said a moment ago, it offers the best ergos of all, including a flippy screen. It is a wonderful stills camera in its own right with high ISO performance on par with the best from Sony, Canon, Nikon, and Leica. And now that I've mentioned it, absolutely the best value among L-Mount Alliance cameras at a moment when the lens ecosystem is growing rapidly. Both Sigma and Panasonic are delivering wonderfully performant and, again, accessibly priced video-ready optics. Then again, video autofocus lags well behind Sony, Canon, Fujifilm, and now Nikon. It shoots 4K 60p in APS-C mode only. Its EVF is only 2.4 million dots. It forsakes the full-sized HDMI port of the S1 and the SL2S for a micro HDMI port, which, say it with me now again, I truly hate because it just isn't a reliable connection on any camera. And the L-Mount Alliance still trails, for now, Sony and Canon in sheer number of new mirrorless mount lenses. If you're thinking about the S5, you may well be thinking about these other cameras, the S1, the Z6 II, Sony a7 III, Canon EOS R6, and maybe, just maybe, the Leica SL2 as well. But it's $400 less expensive than the S1 and EOS R6, and less than half the price of the SL2S. In the real world, the S5 is better than the a7 III in just about every way except video autofocus tracking in particular and price. Frankly, the most compelling alternative to the S5, I think, is the Z6 II. The S5 has the advantages of a flippy screen and no recording limit, while the Z6 II has the advantages of superior autofocus, superior EVF, and for the moment superior lens selection, though this is evolving rapidly with Sigma's impressive rollout of lenses and Panasonic's commitment to new 1.8 primes, like the 85 1.8 I have here. Bottom line on the S5. If the S5 had video autofocus performance equal to Sony's or Canon's or Nikon's, it would be the segment benchmark as it is, it's still the best hybrid camera to beat for video at any price up to around three grand. And for stills photographers who don't shoot wildlife or fast-paced sports, it's as good a stills camera as any at the resolution. Best lens for it? Well, although the S5 is a wonderful stills camera, it's the video capability which truly excites. Panasonic's Lumix S-Pro 2470 2.8 has been designed from the ground up as a true hybrid lens and is outstanding. It offers noticeably superior autofocus performance on Panasonic bodies relative to L-Mount Alliance partner Sigma's otherwise excellent DGDN 24-72.8 and has image quality to boot from excellent sharpness, flare resistance, and chromatic aberration correction to minimal focus breathing. The autofocus is swift and silent. But if video is not your thing, I might start with Sigma's DGDN 35 or 65 F2s. They are a joy in the hand. They perform 
and they are excessively priced. Next up, hmm, Canon's R6. This is pretty simple. The R6 is the first Canon mirrorless full frame camera in my book to be a worthy successor to the 5D series in terms of build quality and functionality with superior video and autofocus capabilities, all the advantages of mirrorless, and the sensor and processor from the company's $6,500 flagship 1DX Mark III. In fact, it has the best autofocus of any camera I've ever used. For $1,400 less than, just two-thirds the price of an R5, the R6 essentially surrenders only the R5's 45 megapixel resolution, 8K recording capability, which is essentially unusable anyway, and a top plate LCD. In other words, stuff that really doesn't matter to 99% of us 99% of the time. It also ditches the non-functional multifunction bar and crippled video and video AF of the original R while adding a second card slot and IBIS. These are the reasons why the R6 is the camera I'd recommend to Canonistas looking to move to mirrorless while remaining in the Canon fold. There's one other reason. Overheating. It's still an issue, no matter what anyone says across video and stills, especially if you use both. You simply do not want to spend a lot of money on a camera you can't count on in the clutch. In other words, think of the R6 as the best bridge investment into ILC mirrorless for Canon shooters at the moment. It is a far better camera than either the R or RP, and I'd argue worth the extra money if your use of it is unlikely to be affected by overheating. You can also think of the R6 as a detuned R5 for a lot less money, making it a less bitter pill to swallow if and when you do hit that heat management wall. This overheating issue, even after firmware updates, is what keeps me from recommending the R5 or R6 to anyone else, along with the premium Canon charges for its bodies and glass. You just don't want to spend more money on a camera you're not sure will shut down in the middle of a wedding or a once-in-a-lifetime trip than a camera that won't shut down for less. I'd counsel you to wait to incur that premium until after overheating truly becomes a non-issue. And I think that's a hardware generation away. Then again, if the build quality, ergos, autofocus performance, benefits of an EVF, articulating screen, reduced size and weight compared to DSLRs, and or the new RF lens ecosystem of the R5 or 6 appeal, and they are excellent, and you don't anticipate you'll have an overheating problem, they're both great cameras, Canon shooter or not. The way one engages video mode on the R5 is ridiculous, but okay, you can get over it. Non-canon alternatives. I think the Nikon Z6 II or Z7 II are where Canon shooters should look first if you're unwilling to surrender good industrial design and feel, but Sony if you're unwilling to surrender autofocus performance or the most practical 4K video hybrid out there. As for a single lens to really bring out the best of the R6, for all around flexibility, take your $1,400 savings and apply it to their RF 24-70 2.8. It's better than Sony's, maybe as good as Nikon's Z24-70, maybe as good, possibly better than their third generation EF 24-70 2.8, which is great, but I didn't have one to test. 
If you're into wildlife, maybe keep your Canon DSLR, but sell off some of your kit to acquire either one of Canon's F11 Super Telephotos, the 600 or 800. But if money's tight and you want the experience of shooting with an EVF, IBIS, yada, 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 you just might want to defer buying an RF lens altogether, opting instead for working with the EF mount glass you've already got by purchasing Canon's neutral density filter adapter. Just saying. Next, Sony's A7S III. This is the benchmark for workaday pros looking for the least compromised, most reliable and performant 4K video-centric hybrid package out there. End of story. It's got the same full-frame sensor, processor, and gyroscopic data as it's almost twice the price, dedicated video cousin FX6. But the A7S III is far less obtrusive, easier to use, has IBIS, and has an ultra-high performance, you know, 9.44 million dot EVF, that isn't even an option on the FX6. It is only the second hybrid to be approved by Netflix, and actually can compete against the three times the price FX9 and who knows how much more expensive Venice. It has no recording limit per se and will shoot uncompromised 4K up to 120 frames per second. It is therefore also the best buy in the entire Sony ecosystem for those who need what it does. On the other hand, the A7S III doesn't have the internal variable electronic neutral density filter of the FX6 and a number of other Sony dedicated cams. It has no internal ND of any kind. It doesn't have built-in XLR inputs, but hey, neither does the FX6. And you can get their XLR K3M dual channel digital XLR audio adapter kit if you want no cables required. The A7S III doesn't have the ergos of cameras like Panasonic, Canon, Nikon, or Leica. The improved menu system is still stupefying. It doesn't have the 6K of the Panasonic S1H, FX6, and FX9, nor the 8K of the Canon EOS R5, never mind the 12K of the Blackmagic. Its 12-megapixel sensor resolution limits its utility somewhat as a stills camera. And while the A7S III has the best heat management of any Sony hybrid I've ever had in hand, kudos to them, it does not defy the laws of physics, guys, and you will have to make accommodations for it in the most tarred climates, which is no big thing. It is also the case that in my stupid simple tracking test, the A7S III, even with updated hybrid phase detect autofocus that the A7S II did not have, was not as good as the autofocus in the R6, nor in this instance, quite as good as that of the Nikon C6 II. The bottom line is this, Sony took the last five years to address, one way or another, just about every legitimate criticism leveled at every one of their alpha cameras, and it has paid off in the A7S III. But heads up guys, it ain't perfect either. As far as lenses are concerned, the A7S III is all about video. If Fujifilm made a full-frame version of their MK18-55 to T 2.9 CineZoom, I'd say that would be the one lens to get. Image quality, parfocal zoom, no focus breathing. It's a fantastic, well-priced CineZoom with very high resolution and fantastic correction. But since they don't, and the A7S III is also about autofocus, I think I would actually recommend you start with the Sony 16-35 to 2.8 G Master if you can live without the narrower field of view offered by a 24 to 70. That's because the 16 to 35 has stellar image quality and great autofocus. And the 24 to 70 2.8 G Master, I just don't love. 
If you do need the flexibility of a 24 to 70 and only want one lens, I'd opt for Sigma's DGDN 24 to 70 2.8, though be forewarned, the autofocus is not quite at the same level of native Sony glass. Otherwise, I'd suggest complementing the 16 to 35 with Sony's FE 85 1.8 and calling it a day. Finally, Leica's SL2S. Yeah. A Leica, a Best Buy? Well, yeah. Let's all have a little humility and recognize that there are perspectives, priorities, and budgets other than our own. In this context, the SL2 is exceptional. You can think of the SL2S as a lower resolution SL2 with superior video capability and a high ISO performance for about $1,000 less, or as a radically updated original SL for just about $3,000 less. If you really want to go there, an unbelievably more capable and flexible EVF, IBIS, and autofocusing equipped Leica M10P, which can still work beautifully with native Leica M or R glass for closing in on $4,000 less. The SL2S offers the identical body EVF, IBIS, and weather sealing of the SL2, autofocus in line with the SL2, fewer megapixels to have to push around notwithstanding, all of which, by the way, are superior to the original SL, and with a brand new to Leica 24 megapixel backside illuminated sensor, offers more video capability than the SL2, and low light performance equal to or better than the very best full frame cameras, period. In my most recent test, it was the top. Check out the video. I'll put a link down in the show notes below. It is the sweet spot in the entire Leica full frame lineup with that utterly unique Leica feel and the best menu system in the full frame space, exceeded only by Hasselblad, which is medium format. Downsides. Well, other than video and tracking autofocus, which, though as good or better than any other L Mount Alliance body, still lag that of any hybrid phase detect system. And a price more than double that of the very similar, internally speaking, Panasonic Lumix S5, and more expensive than any other hybrid in this group by at least $1,000. And I am including the uh, R5 in that group. Not a darn thing. But I am not giving up my SL2. Competition. The thing of it is, it's really only Leica itself, at least for those of us who recognize what a Leica is and isn't and have the appetite and budget to act on that recognition. On the other hand, if budget is an issue, and for most of us it is, if Leica build quality, ergonomics, industrial design, and access to what I perceive to be the most consistently outstanding prime lens lineup in the business are not, then it's fairly easy to make the case that any of the cameras I've mentioned are better buys. As for lenses, what one lens would I recommend? I can share with you my in real life decision. I bought my SL2, where, it's right in front of me, <laughs> it's too many, uh, with the Apo Summicron SL35, anticipating its use as the last street lens I'd ever buy. The thing of it is, the SL2S can do just about anything. In our age of social distancing, were I interested in the SL2S first and foremost as a street camera, I'd go for Sigma's DGDN65 F2. It's beautifully built, wonderful in hand, more flexible than Sigma's brilliant DGDN85.4, and punches so far above its weight class optically that I'm going to have to get one for my SL2 to join my Aposumicron and the Sigma DGDN85.1.4 I already own. Although... 
the aposumicron is incredible. But if video is your angle, I'd once again opt for Panasonic's Lumix S Pro 24-70 That's it, really. This episode was brought to you by Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to click the link down in the show notes below will get a free trial of premium membership so that you can explore your creativity. Give them a go. Thanks, Skillshare. If you like what you've seen here today, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below because this is an incredible audience. If you'd like a copy of our Streets of New York, the book, head over to www.3bmep.com slash books. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one video session with me for a portfolio review, explore or hone your artistic voice, select gear and more, sign up at www.3bmep.com slash booking. Finally, consider supporting our work by using our no-cost-to-you affiliate links down below, picking up some official three blind men and an elephant swag at 3bmep.threadless.com, sending coffee money via PayPal, or best of all, join us as a patron over at Patreon. However you choose to support us, as always, we thank you for it. <laughs>